there is no one who knows me or who has ever known me who knows anything about me really they know they're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people basically and the only person who knows about what I'm telling you the kind of things I'm telling you is me how long have you been two different people? <laughs> long time 14 years Israel Keys was a high-performance monster trained as a Special Forces Ranger in the U.S. Army. You could have been one of Israel Keys' victims. So could I. He didn't have a type. And he happily took men and women. He didn't hunt in just one area or even one country. He hid weapons in parks and forests around the United States. He memorized the coordinates of their locations and used them years later. He paid for his travels with bank robberies and covered up his crimes with arson. He's the boogeyman. He's possibly responsible for dozens of missing people around the world thanks to his time in the military. Yet, only three victims have been linked to him without a doubt. You think you're scared? Israel Keys scared the FBI so badly they reclassified his case from serial murder to terrorism. Now, let me tell you how he got caught. I want to thank Daily Harvest for sponsoring this episode. True story. The week before we got started with Daily Harvest, I was pulling through a drive through for at least 60% of my meals. Now, I'm no doctor, but that can't be healthy. And then I tried the chocolate blueberry smoothie from Daily Harvest, and it was like, oh... Daily Harvest, they never use preservatives, added sugar, or artificial anything. All the ingredients are printed right on the packaging, and I promise you will recognize every word as actual human food. It's amazing. So get started today. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code TRUE to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code TRUE for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. It's dailyharvest.com. Now, on with the show. I'm Amy, and this is True Crime Recaps. So before we get into this, I want to thank Maureen Callahan, author of American Predator. She is a big reason why we know so much about this man. So the government didn't want to release any information until Maureen sued to force them to comply with the Freedom of Information Act. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, they fought it. A lot of what you're going to hear today comes directly from the research she used to write that book. Okay. Let's jump to the Common Grounds Coffee Kiosk in Anchorage, Alaska on February 1st, 2012. High school senior Samantha Koenig was working alone, as per usual. Closing time was 8 p.m. and her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up after. The two of them shared a truck and a house with her single father. That night, Samantha and her boyfriend were text fighting in between customers. He was flirting with other girls on Facebook. She was pissed. About five minutes before closing time, a tall man in his 30s with longish dark hair showed up and ordered an Americano coffee. Now you can see for yourself what happened next. Check out this security video published by the Anchorage Daily News.
not see it in the video, but Home Depot and IHOP are across the street. On February 1st, the view of the kiosk was partially obstructed with snowdrifts five feet high. According to Israel, he'd been staking out the place for days from a vantage point in that parking lot. He worked as a contractor, and normally his white Chevy truck had a lumber rack, a toolbox, and Key's construction signs on it. But that night, he'd stripped it of all identifying marks, including the license plates. So why Common Grounds? Why Samantha? For the simple reason that it was open later than the other coffee places. That's it. As far as Samantha went, the first time he ever saw her was when he took her. That's how he operated. He chose his crime scenes, not his victims. Take a listen. Back when I was smart, I would um, do it. I would let them come to me. I would kind of go to a remote area that's not anywhere near where you live, but that other people go to as well. You might not get exactly what you're, there's not much to choose from in a manner of speaking, but there's also no witnesses really, there's nobody else around. He liked to find his victims in isolated places like campgrounds, hiking trails, and even cemeteries. So what happened in Anchorage with Samantha was the first time he ever deviated from his typical MO and took someone from such a highly populated place near where he lived. It's hard to see what's happening in the surveillance video, but according to the FBI FOIA documents referenced in American Predator, Israel leaned in to zip tie Samantha's hands behind her back before he jumped through the window. Oh, a lot has been said about the need for panic buttons in these kinds of businesses, especially when employees are closing up alone at night. But the thing is, there was a panic button in the little coffee shop. Samantha didn't push it. And I think I can shed some light on why not. Two reasons. Israel was wearing an earpiece so he could listen to his police scanner. And when he pointed his weapon at her, he assured her that he just wanted money. And if she set off an alarm, he was going to know about it and, you know, hurt her. That, combined with the paralyzing fear that she must have been feeling, might explain why she didn't call for help. And when he vaulted through the window, he shoved a handful of paper napkins into her mouth so she couldn't scream. She had a 22 revolver pointed at her back as he marched her across the street where his truck was parked. After they walked out of camera range, he noticed a high-end camera on the ground. And when he stooped to pick it up, Samantha ran, but he was faster. He tackled her and warned her that if she tried to escape again, he wouldn't be happy. Her next chance to get help came right away. When they got to his truck, a group of diners from the IHOP were standing nearby, but she stayed quiet. He waited until the people left before he forced her into the passenger seat and belted her in. The police would have seen all that for themselves, but they didn't pull the surveillance footage from the businesses around the coffee shop right away. For the next four or five hours, he drove her around Anchorage, stopping in a few parks to wait until it got later before he brought her home. He couldn't take her back to his place yet because his live-in girlfriend and 10-year-old daughter were still awake. Now, more than once, Samantha was within yelling distance of more than a dozen people, two of them cops, but no one gave them a second glance. He told her he was holding her for ransom. When her father paid, he'd let her go. Now, Samantha's father wasn't rich, but he said it would be fine. Her dad would come up with the money. Israel had moved to Alaska from Washington State to be with his girlfriend in 2007, five years before Samantha's nightmare started. She worked as a nurse and loved to travel, just like him. Well, not just like him. When they met online, he was living in Nia Bay, Washington, with the mother of his child, working as a general contractor for the Makah tribe that lives there, which she was a part of. All in all, the tribe thought he was a great guy. He doted on his daughter, he was reliable, he did good work. And that is basically the gist of what his customers in Anchorage thought of him too. They trusted him, he had keys to their homes. But when his daughter's mother spiraled into substance abuse, Israel moved on to a new woman in Alaska. Eventually, he got full custody of his daughter and the three of them lived together in Anchorage. Although, by the time this story starts, he was already planning on leaving his girlfriend and Alaska behind for a new life with his daughter as a traveling contractor in America's storm corridors. Like he said to an old army buddy he thought might have been a lot like him, 
What better way to find vulnerable victims than in a place ravaged by a hurricane or tornado? And here's hoping the FBI is keeping close tabs on that army buddy, just in case Israel was right about the things they had in common. Now, meanwhile, Samantha's father and boyfriend were frantic with worry. Her boyfriend got to Common Grounds to pick her up around 8.30, and the place was dark. He said later he didn't go inside to check it out because he didn't want to trigger an alarm. All he could see were towels and napkins scattered around, very unlike his tidy girlfriend. He had no idea how close he came to being taken himself. Originally, Israel wanted to stay and wait for him so he could grab them both together, but he decided against it. Later, when accusations were being tossed around, the police verified his story with their surveillance footage from the kiosk. But they didn't keep watching the rest of the night's footage because if they had, they would have seen Israel come back to Common Grounds around 11 p.m. He'd forgotten to take Samantha's phone, and he wanted to lock the place up. That way, it would look like she'd robbed the place and left on her own, which is exactly what the police thought at first. His ability to predict law enforcement's response accurately was what made him so brazen he had no problem kidnapping his victims from public places or even in broad daylight. But like I said, this business of taking someone where he lived, that was new, and he was already making mistakes. When he grabbed her cell, he picked up some zip ties he'd left behind and he straightened the place up a little, all in the name of creating the illusion that she'd simply vanished with the $200 in the cash register. But then, as he was about to drive away again, he remembered another item he wanted, her car keys. At 11.30 p.m., he sent two texts from her phone, one to her boyfriend and one to her boss. Now, according to American Predator, this is what her boyfriend got. F you, asshole. I know what you did. I am going to spend a couple of days with friends. Need time to think, plan, acting weird. Let my dad know. Samantha's boss got a similar message at the same time. So after the messages were sent, her phone was turned off and the battery removed to make it untrackable. Israel did the same thing with his own phone. That was a rule of his, and he always followed it. By midnight on February 1st, 2012, he figured it was safe to take Samantha home with him. His neighborhood was well-kept and middle-class. Neighbors knew each other, but in Alaska, you learn to mind your own business, for better or worse. And that's what they did with him. Still, he left her tied up and covered with tarps in the back seat for about an hour just to make sure there were no eyes on them when he walked her blindfolded into his shed. He always kept that shed double locked. No one in their little family was allowed inside. He'd prepped it with space heaters and a tarp laid across the floor for just this occasion. The tarp was a bad, bad sign. The foam pad and sleeping bag on top of it not great either. But Samantha was clinging to hope that her situation was only temporary. Israel sat her down and tethered her neck to the wall so she couldn't move. He got her address and pin number and left her in the shed with the radio turned up loud, blasting heavy metal music, his favorite. When he got her to the house, he let himself into her truck, which was parked in front, and grabbed her license and ATM card. It was 2.30 a.m. on February 2nd, 2012. Now, maybe he made more noise than he thought, or maybe something more primal woke up her boyfriend and got him outside. But all of a sudden, the two men were staring at each other. Then her boyfriend went back inside, probably to wake up her father for help. That's when Israel ran. On his way back to Samantha, he stopped at an ATM to make sure the pin she gave him worked. But when he got there, he couldn't remember it. He hadn't written it down. So he went back to the shed got the pin again, scratched it into the front of the card, and drove back to test it out on the ATM. By this time, it was after 3 a.m., and he was running out of time. Israel and his daughter were leaving that morning for a two-week vacation. His girlfriend was going to meet up with them in a few days. They were all going on a Caribbean cruise out of Louisiana. The two of them were supposed to be in a cab by 5 a.m., two hours from now. It was split-second timing that seemed impossible. Like, who would take a woman hours before leaving on a trip? Well, he'd planned it that way. He thrived on little sleep and energy drinks because he was doing what he loved and he was only getting started. Now, when he got back to Samantha, he let her believe the ransom demand had been made and she'd be going free soon. He handed her a glass of water while he sipped on his own glass of wine. It was the hope that excited him, the hope and the fear. And he manipulated his victim's emotions, so he got plenty of both. 
He made a big show of releasing her bonds, and then he grabbed her and used rope to tie her back up, tighter and rougher than he had before. The look in her eyes told him she knew it was over. He violated her twice, and when it was over, she tried to convince him to let her live. So 15 or 16 years earlier, in July of 96 or 97, one of his first victims did the same thing, but that time it worked. He was in his late teens living with his family in Maupin, Oregon, near the Deschutes River, when he decided to assault and murder a girl in one of the public bathrooms along the beach. This, it's horrifying. He hid in the bushes and waited for someone to come along. A group of teens tubing down the river passed by, and one of them, a girl about 14 to 18 years old, probably closer to 14, was lagging behind. So he waded into the water and literally grabbed her inner tube and pulled her to shore. And if that doesn't put you on high alert, if you're planning on doing any river tubing this summer, then you're braver than me. He took her into the bathroom, tied her up the way he tied up Samantha, and assaulted her. But she wouldn't stop talking. She promised not to say anything. She told him how good-looking he was. She even said that the assault wasn't a problem if he just let her go. And before he knew it, he did. He just put her back on her inner tube and pushed her back into the river and hoped he wouldn't get caught. And to this day, that girl has not come forward to publicly talk about what happened to her. That was the last time he ever let anyone go. Before I dive into the next recap, I want to thank Daily Harvest for sponsoring this episode. Now, some people have asked me if Daily Harvest is really worth the money, and I want to be honest. So, I have a quick story for you. For the longest time, I had this dream of opening a healthy foods restaurant in Key West. I know, it's a little out there, but without boring you with a lot of background, let me just tell you that I was experimenting with a lot of juices and smoothies and healthy cooking at home. And you know, this was a while ago. And, and, and I can tell you that trying to eat healthy was a lot harder than I thought it would be. But when Amy and I started with Daily Harvest, it was like my dream restaurant was being delivered to our door. It's all built on organic fruits and vegetables. It stays fresh in the freezer until you're ready to enjoy it. And it takes literally minutes to prepare. The other day, I had the vanilla bean and apple chia bowl, and it was so good. I had to laugh at the idea that I ever thought I could make this kind of food myself. So, to the people who ask me if it's worth the money, I say absolutely yes. But don't take my word for it. Get started today. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code TRUE to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code TRUE for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. Now, on with the show. As much information as Israel shared with law enforcement after everything went to hell, there were some things he wouldn't talk about. Why? Well... He said he wanted to keep those memories for himself. And one of those memories involved Samantha's last moments. He said he put on leather gloves and strangled her. That was his typical MO. And then he stuck his blade in her back below her right shoulder blade. Why would he do that? That was totally not his MO. Because she was fighting for life and he wanted to end it quicker? He said no, but he didn't want to go into his reasons why. Regardless of his reasons, and unfortunately, I have not been able to stop speculating, which has caused many sleepless nights, but regardless of why, he took her life. And then he went inside and woke up his daughter because they had a cruise to get to. So while she was getting ready, he went back out and rolled Samantha up in the tarp, foam pad, and sleeping bag, and put her body in the cabinet in his shed. And then they went on their trip. So I told you Israel liked to travel. Let's dig into that a little bit more. He was a fan of taking someone out in one place, then driving their body to a new place, sometimes hours away in a different state, and then getting rid of the evidence in yet another location, thousands of miles apart. He'd fly to one place, then rent a car and drive to yet another state, and he was always prepared. He buried dozens of equipment caches in remote areas around the United States. These could be stashes of weapons and or tools like shovels or Drano for getting rid of a body, cash, anything he might need to take a life. His caches were found in upstate New York and Washington, but there's plenty more out there. These weren't marked on any map. 
He remembered where each one was, sometimes for years before going back to use it. And he financed these trips by robbing banks. He's been linked to at least two robberies in Texas and upstate New York. In Texas, he burned down a house to distract emergency responders so he could rob the bank. Arson was a favorite of his, and he claimed to use it to dispose of bodies and destroy crime scenes. For this trip, this two-week cruise vacation, he flew with his daughter from Anchorage to Seattle to Houston. Then he rented a car and drove to Louisiana to meet up with his girlfriend and board the ship. After the cruise, his girlfriend met up with friends for a road trip, and he took his daughter to Wells, Texas to visit with his family. Thanks to a mandatory psych exam during his time in prison, we know more about his origin story than he wanted to share at first. His family was a sore point for Israel, and he rarely talked about them and never about his father. He was born into an extremely religious family in Cove, Utah on January 7, 1978. He's the second of 10 children. None of the kids went to school or even had a birth certificate or social security number. They'd all been born at home. Back then, his parents identified as Mormons, but they were leaning heavily toward rigid survivalist tendencies. They even went further in that direction when they moved to Colville, Washington when he was a kid. They dropped Mormonism and joined a new church, the Ark. And if you're not familiar with it, the Ark is based on Christian identity theology, which basically means that any race other than white and any religion or church other than the Ark is subhuman. So think white supremacist times 100. At the same time, Israel was realizing that his evil urges were not what anyone might call normal. He was also coming to terms with his bisexuality, which was labeled evil by the church. So by 10 years old, he was following the psychopath playbook for the formative years. Stealing weapons, setting fires, breaking into homes, and of course, torturing pets. He bragged about being very good at sitting out in the woods for hours on end without making a move. If a hiker came by, it excited him to be able to watch them without them knowing. The family lived in the middle of the woods, isolated from most of civilization. His father worked as an appliance repairman, but his dream was to build the family a cabin to live in. So while he worked on it, the family lived in tents for years with no electricity or running water. As the oldest boy, it was Israel's responsibility to take care of the family, hunt game for food, and help his father build their house. They made friends with other people in the church, although he was always a loner. As he said, quote, I've known since I was 14 that there were things that I thought were normal and that were okay that nobody else seemed to think were normal and okay. Well, except for a couple of notable childhood friends. He palled around with the Kehoe brothers, Chevy and Shane. They were white supremacists about the same age as he was, and the two families both attended the Ark Church. Among their many other crimes, Shane did time for targeting police officers, and Chevy was linked to the Oklahoma City bombing and Timothy McVeigh. He was ultimately convicted for wiping out a gun dealer's family, including their eight-year-old daughter. So, that's who Israel Keys hung out with as a kid. By the time he was a teenager, he left the church and declared himself to be an atheist. His father disowned him and later passed away in 2002. In the late 90s, the family moved to Maupin, Oregon. In 1998, despite the fact that he didn't have a social security number or a birth certificate, he joined the army and was stationed at Fort Lewis near Tacoma, Washington. He also spent some time at Fort Hood in Texas and served in Egypt. By all accounts, he really took to the military and excelled at ranger training. So author Maureen Callahan had this to say about his service. Quote, In what way did the U.S. Army or the government help build a better monster? I've put in a request for his military file and only got back eight pages. Now, what I learned later from getting the FBI witness interviews with the guys Keyes had served with was that he was a kind of super soldier, and he was also the most effed up guy they'd ever encountered. He scared the crap out of them. Every place he was stationed or traveled to during that time could have potential victims of his, including Belize, yet another place he liked to go, which had some important significance to him. He was honorably discharged in July 2001, the same year his daughter was born. And after she was born, he said it made him take a stand against hurting kids. 
Too bad his relationship with her mother didn't inspire him to stop hurting women. He got back to Anchorage on February 18th and staged an elaborate ransom demand. This next part is hard to stomach. He violated Samantha's body, and then he posed her with a newspaper he got from the trash dated February 13th. To make this proof of life look convincing, he braided her hair, a skill he'd mastered thanks to his daughter, and he put layer after layer of foundation on her skin. He sewed her eyes open with a 10-pound fishing line, held her head up, and took a Polaroid. He copied the picture along with a typed ransom demand for $30,000 to be deposited into her bank account. He left it under a sign for a missing dog named Albert. So this is the text he sent to her dad on February 24th. Connor Park sign under pick of Albert, ain't she purdy? She'd been gone for 23 days. He disposed of her body in pieces by cutting a hole through the ice covering Matanuska Lake an hour away. He disguised what he was doing with an ice fishing shack that he set up around the hole. Then he headed to a parent-teacher conference for his daughter. Divers recovered Samantha's body about a month later in early April. For two weeks after her disappearance, Anchorage PD was sure she'd staged the robbery with the help of an accomplice, which is how they were describing him after seeing that surveillance video. It wasn't until they saw the other surveillance footage showing her attempted escape that they started to believe she'd been taken against her will. But that still left the question of what to do. And specifically, should her father agree to pay the ransom or should they cancel her card and cell phone and force his hand? Keep in mind, they didn't know the picture was staged. I mean, not for sure. All but one person believed that she was alive. Now, finally, they decided to keep the bank card and phone active in hopes that it might lead them to her captor, and they were right. Before he sent that ransom demand, her account only had a few dollars in it. On February 29th, her father deposited $5,000 of the $30,000 ransom. Hours later, Israel was seen withdrawing some of the cash from an Anchorage ATM. The security footage from that trip to the bank would soon be on investigators' desks, and they kept watching the account for more withdrawals. They didn't have long to wait. A little before 10.30 p.m. on March 7th, another withdrawal for $400 popped up, but it wasn't in Anchorage. It wasn't even in Alaska. It was at an ATM 3,800 miles away in Wilcox, Arizona. The FBI analyzed the security footage for anything they could use to identify him, and they hit the jackpot. A 2012 white Ford Focus was seen in the background. The next withdrawal came an hour later in New Mexico. Both locations were right off Interstate 10, so they guessed that he would keep traveling that direction, so the FBI put out an alert for police along that route in Texas, knowing he was headed toward the little town of Lufkin. Israel was in that area for his sister's wedding, and by then his mother and some of his siblings were living in Wells, Texas, about 20 minutes away from Lufkin. On March 13, 2012, a patrolman spotted his rental car in the parking lot of a Quality Inn and followed him. As he was accelerating, he went a couple of miles over the speed limit. That gave the officer cause to pull him over. He had stolen cash and Samantha's license and ATM card in his wallet. Her phone and his disguise and weapons were also found with him. Interestingly, on this trip, he was driving two rental cars. At some point between the time he pulled cash from the ATM in Arizona and when he was finally arrested in Texas, his rental had broken down and he got a new one. Except it was the same make and model the police were looking for, and if he'd been given a different car, he might never have been caught. He was extradited back to Alaska for questioning in Samantha's disappearance, and that's when Israel decided to talk. He thought mistakenly, that they had more on him, so he confessed. And then he started bargaining. His biggest worry was for his daughter. He knew what he'd done, okay, clearly, and what the police might find if they kept digging, and he wanted to spare her the publicity. He offered to volunteer information about other victims, but he had some demands in exchange. He wanted his name kept out of the media. He wanted peanut butter Snickers bars, wild and mild cigars, and Americano coffee the same coffee he ordered before taking Samantha. Also, the same junk food and cigars he had when he was staking out the common ground kiosk before he took her. 
But he had one more request, and it was the most important. He wanted an execution date within a year. They agreed, but only if he gave them more names. That's when he gave them the names of Bill and Lorraine Courier in Essex, Vermont. They were a couple in their 50s who went missing in June 2011. Before Israel's confession, the only lead was an eyewitness description of a man seen driving their car. He left behind no DNA, no evidence, and no one had any clue what might have happened to them. Israel had been on a trip to visit family in Maine, and he had a weapons cache he wanted to use in the Vermont area. Per his usual methods, he flew into Chicago, rented a car, and drove through Vermont. When he stopped in Essex, he went looking for a house with an attached garage and no kids or dogs. That's how he found Bill and Lorraine. He burst into their bedroom in the early morning hours, tied them up, and drove them in their car to an abandoned house he'd found earlier for that purpose. He planned to sexually assault both of them, but ended up using his weapon on Bill after he almost escaped. He violated, then strangled Lorraine. The couple lay covered in garbage bags in the basement of that house for over a year before it was torn down and their bodies were unknowingly taken to the landfill. They've never been recovered. Throughout more than 40 hours of interviews, of which the FBI has only released a few to the public, over the course of about eight months, Israel never once expressed any regret. The only thing that upset him was finding out he'd left a piece of evidence behind. Check out this clip. On the tray that holds the ammo in there, there's a perfect right thumbprint for Israel. Yeah, right. No, there is. <laughs> I don't have the lab report. Yet, <laughs> wow. Uh oh. So, more CSI stuff. Yeah, I'm impressed. Well, I'm disappointed in myself mostly, but I'm. <laughs> answered questions and offered information, but only as much and as willingly as he wanted. And as I said earlier, he wanted to keep most of his memories, as he called them, to himself. He only shared enough to have his demands met. When pressed, he offered a few vague clues about other victims. And for the sake of time, I won't go down that long and winding rabbit hole here, but I can recommend an in-depth podcast that devoted like, whole seasons to this case. It's called True Crime BS. And it's hosted by Josh Hallmark. Let's just say Israel's been connected to missing people all over the world, and some of them have become high-profile cases, like Maura Murray, who vanished from New Hampshire in 2004, and Lauren Spear, who went missing from Indiana in 2011, to name only two in the U.S. Based on his own research, he told police one of his victims was ruled an accident, and investigators are pretty sure that another one of his unnamed victims is this woman, 49-year-old Deborah Feldman. She might have been taken from New Jersey in April 2009 and transported to Tupper Lake, New York. Israel has confessed to robbing the bank in Tupper Lake, but what happened to Deborah, or if he absolutely was responsible for her, is something he wouldn't talk about. And then, suddenly, the whole thing was over. I told you he wanted an execution date within a year. Well, by his final recorded interview on November 29th, 2012, it was clear that was not going to happen. So Israel took it into his own hands. On the morning of December 1st, 2012, his body was found in his cell. According to the Anchorage Daily News, sometime after 10, 12 p.m. the night before, he wrapped a bedsheet around his neck and tied it to his ankle. Then he cut his wrist with a weapon he'd fashioned out of a pencil and a disposable razor blade, which the guards had been told repeatedly not to give to him. On a surveillance video of the entire unit from a camera above the guard's desk 25 feet away, movement can be seen in his cell until a final jerk at 10.24 p.m. The word Belize was written in blood, according to American Predator. A four-page suicide note was also found under his body. He didn't leave any other clues or information behind that might help bring closure to any of his other victims. Mainly, his suicide note was a creepy ode to his victims with a big helping of screw America. One of the creepier lines, and there's a lot to choose from, but for me, the creepiest one was this. 
Your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through highlights of red. What color, I wonder, and how straight will it turn, plastered back with the sweat of your blood? Ugh. Holy crap. But wait, there's more. A few months before his suicide, they found 11 skulls in a satanic esque drawing under his bunk. He used his own blood to draw them. One of the skulls has the words, we are one, written underneath it. So what do you think that's about? Because of these macabre pictures and some comments he made in the interview sessions, the FBI believes there are a total of 11 victims. But many, many people think there are many, many more. Now, what do you believe? While you're thinking about it, I've got one more thing you have to hear, and this is wild. What would you say if I told you that there was another Israel Keys in Montana and he was also a violent criminal? In 2008, this guy took the lives of his wife and son before ending his own life in Plains, Montana, according to the Montana Standard. So what kind of unholy coincidence is that? Israel Keys was a monster, the stuff of nightmares, and in nightmares, anything can happen. And that is your recap. Thank you so much for clicking this video. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you. And if you like getting all the crime in half the time, please do us the huge favor of hitting like and subscribe. It only takes about half a second, but it means the world to us. You can also listen for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again. See you soon. Thank you.